today's uh, virtual plant clinic. Today, David Yost is going to be discussing uh, fall foliage and fall flowers. Um, so I've got us recording and uh, we should be live on Facebook if we aren't already then in just a minute. Uh, so for those of you who are new to our virtual plant clinic, um, just know if you have questions, if you're on Facebook, you can write it into the comments. I'll be monitoring that during. If you are on our Zoom page, then you can hit the Q&A button uh, at the, on your Zoom menu and we'll see the questions that way. So we'll be watching both of those uh, streams for questions during the class. So uh, David, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you so you can get us started. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining me. What a fabulous, beautiful day is. Uh, it really is feeling like fall now that we've got, you know, the days are getting shorter, the temperatures are cooler, and, you know, the air is crisp. Uh, everybody, non-gardeners and gardeners alike, everybody likes to get out and work in the yard at this time of year. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about today is we're going to feature just a bunch of plants that really kind of reach uh, their peak or take center stage, I said, at this time of year. So I've kind of grouped these together. We're talking about plants with attractive berries, plants with uh, attractive flowers this time of year. We'll kind of stop, take questions, comments, uh, anything you want to share with the group. And then we'll go and switch our emphasis and look at fall foliage for trees and shrubs. Now I had an extremely hard time figuring out what to put into my slide set today because there's so many different things to look at. We have such a diverse community of plants and it's personally like my favorite time of the year and peak season for colors. So I end up, I have too much stuff and not enough time today, but we're not gonna compromise on taking your questions or anything. I'm gonna go through these things pretty quickly. So this is one of those times you may wanna have a notepad handy because uh, I'm gonna hit quite a few plants uh, probably fairly fast pace. Um, and with that, I'm not gonna waste any more time. We're just gonna get started. So I wanna begin by talking really about berries. Uh, I don't know exactly why, I just kind of randomly decided that's where I wanted to uh, begin the program. So this is Beautyberry. Uh, many people are familiar with this, Calicarpa. Uh, and at this time of year, uh, I took this picture, I think about two, three days ago, the berries are really starting to ripen up. One of the things I thought was really interesting is I just discovered this is now in the mint family. Of course, most of my life, it's been in the verbena family, but as we learn more about plants, now we realize it's in the mint family. I didn't even know that we had woody members in there. So things are always changing and progressing. This is good, it's how we learn. So beauty berry is just, tough as nails in terms of durability. We just don't have any pest issues with it. No insects, diseases. Uh, checking, I don't even think I have any problems with deer browsing off. Double check with me on that. So tough, durable. Uh, the thing is you see it kind of limited use because in the summertime, it's a little bit blase looking. Uh, the flowers are small, kind of nondescript. Uh, the plant doesn't have a real distinctive form. But as we go into late summer and these berries start to ripen up, it's got a lot of the wow factor. Now, this is one of the times when I think our native species, the Calicarpa americana, is actually way more attractive than some of the introduced ones. Uh, we bring these introduced ones in for purple uh, berries, for, for uh, some of them have a white berry on it. Uh, so there's a lot of berry abilities in here. But our native species, the cluster of berries, completely surrounds the twig that you can see like that. It will get sort of an inch, maybe even two inches in diameter. So it's really showy. Uh, and then there's also, I just discovered, first time I've seen it, but over here, I don't know if this is gonna fit into the screen. You can barely see it, but it's one that's called Welch's. It is our native one, but it's got a pink berry on there. So these are really, uh, cool, spectacular plants and a nice way to bring native plants into your garden. It can get to be about six foot by six foot over time though. And so that's, again, you need to have a little bit of space for it. And it's got to be a place where you can enjoy it at this time of the year, but it's not going to really serve that focal point kind of function uh, throughout the year. And then of course it does drop its leaves in the winter time. So that's beauty berry. And again, we sometimes don't fully appreciate the value of berries uh, that they add to the landscape, but not only are they pretty to look at, but this is food that supports wildlife. 
And again, the, the red chokeberry, Peronia arbutifolia, uh, this has, the berries are just starting to color up. You can barely see them in this image, but they will progress from a green into a bright red coloration. And this plant also gets really nice fall color in the foliage as we progress through the season. So again, I, this was pictures that I'd taken this weekend. So the plant has not had time to fully develop into its full glory of the autumn color. But believe me, it is really spectacular. Both foliage and berry provides good wildlife habitat. One of the things nice also with the uh, chokeberry is that this really thrives in wet conditions. Uh, so it's adapted to these dense, heavy, wet clay soils that we live and sometimes have to garden in. And that's an environment that can be challenging to find plants that will thrive in that condition. Uh, we're now, because again, the renewed interest in native plants, we're offering a selection of different varieties. The straight species tends to get kind of tall and leggy, but there are other varieties available now that stay smaller and more compact and kind of lend themselves well to suburban landscapes. So check that one out. Uh, we've got a nice selection of them in here. Uh, and you might want to take a look at that and put it on, on the agenda for the fall garden. Viburnum, again, is a group of plants. Uh, they're all phenomenal in their own right. They pretty much all of them have really nice uh, flowers, fruits, and fall color that goes with them. Uh, again, because of time limitations, I just, just put this one in as kind of a, to whet your appetite. Uh, this is uh, Viburnum nudum. Again, it is a native species. This particular cultivar, and it came out of the Winter Garden, and it its flower. Right, this is from earlier in the year. the The berries. I was going to say the flowers come out in spring, and then what's really, really distinctive on this, when those berries start to ripen up, you get this mishmash of kind of the blue and the uh, pink berries interspersed in there. You know, it's just it just looks unreal. Uh, I would say, I'm guessing that picture is probably taken kind of, uh, maybe it would have been eight weeks ago or something. At this point in time, uh, those berries have matured. Uh, and so they're not going to look like that today. I only explain that because I'm hoping you guys come in to visit us at the nursery and the garden center. And you might see this and say, wow, that's phenomenal. Again, I love plants that change through the season. I get kind of bored with evergreens are just static throughout the year. So again, I, I'm probably over elaborating on. So when you look at these, the color of the berries progress over time and season, the same as the color of the foliage progresses and changes over the time of the season. And you can see in the upper corner, I'm trying to demonstrate or show this is what the fall coloration will look like. So right now we're kind of between, hey, the berries have kind of matured, but the fall color hasn't come in. Uh, and you get nice green, uh, lustrous foliage on through the summertime. So again, just really a wonderful group of plants. There's one they call blue muffin, which is a native uh, form, I think, of the arrowwood viburnum. Uh, it stays small, compact. It gets blueberries kind of on it. Leather leaf viburnums that are evergreen. So it's just a, a huge group of tough reliable and durable plants. Uh, I just realized, so yeah, I'm still on my berries group. That's right, I'm still on berries and when time's flying by. Uh, I, of course, we have to talk about winter berry. Uh, again, another native shrub, uh, native to Virginia that's in here. With hollies, uh, there are separate male and female plants. Uh, we Most of us know this, but it's the female that produces the berries. So it is important that we partner them up and we have both, uh, at least, you know, you could have one male and you could have, you know, several females are in there, but we want to ensure we get good pollination. Uh, it takes me back to the viburnums I failed to mention, but viburnums, they're self-fertile, they're self-pollinating, but you will get much better results if you have more than one so that they can allow for cross-pollination. So as a general rule, if you're trying to produce really spectacular, good show of berries or nice display in your garden, you're probably going to want more than one um, if, that, if that works out for your design. So again, the photograph here, that's um, the winter berry in the background, Ilex reticulata. The 
foliage is starting to go into the fall foliage season. So you get this kind of yellowish coloration and it's, it's kind of weird, but I sort of grown to like it. That sort of red and orange uh, kind of colors in one sense, they almost clash, but it looks, it looks neat. So I, I'm on board with it. Again, these are plants that sometimes, uh, you know, during the growing season, uh, again, there's not something that's really distinctive. There's nothing necessarily eye catching about them, but for this time of year, pretty much unbeatable and I think this shows nice where it's partnered up with the um, ornamental grasses as so all that also really goes into its peak here in, as we go into October November. There's a lot of different varieties and cultivars on these um, winterberry hollies. Uh, winter red which is here that's one of the larger more robust varieties that's why I think it's showing up in the picture where you saw the whole plant Winter gold to show you kind of a variety of coloration that goes in there with sort of the orange berries. There's compact forms uh, and then there's intermediate sizes. So again, you, you come in, most of these plants I'm talking about, they really represent a group of plants and you can sort of pick size, color, uh, whatever really fits best into your agenda. This has become a huge tradition at the, uh, for Christmas decorating. And there's people now commercially grow these just to cut the stems. And when you come into our Christmas shop, you'll find the cut stems because of, you can, as you can see, the leaves drop off of there as we progress later into the season, but the berries stick and adhere to the twigs and they hang on pretty late into the winter season. So they'll carry us all through the Christmas holidays and they're real popular for use in that condition as well. Then sort of the very late winter, early spring, the berries by that time sort of ripen, mature, and the birds will come collect them. And if you're lucky, maybe a few of them will seed themselves. Again, this is a stream valley plant, so it will do well in that part sun, part shade, kind of damp environments, you know, which doesn't necessarily have to have the excellent well-drained soil that so many other plants really want and thrive on the garden. Uh, so that's what I covered for berries. I'm gonna kind of lump this together in an effort to stay on schedule and talk about some flowers uh, because right now at the end of the season is uh, our growing season is kind of winding down for the year. It's really phenomenal that we have some plants that this becomes their peak bloom time. I've got this almost a uh, love affair going with uh, camellias. I said, because uh, so many of us are looking for evergreen flowering shrubs in our landscape. And I feel like camellias, I actually have better success with camellias say than I do rhododendrons and somewhat I think um, where for where mountain laurels, uh, I think camellias can fill a niche there. So this gives me a broad leaf flowering evergreen that uh, has been very reliable. Camellias historically were a Southern plant um, and they weren't real popular in our immediate area because the winter times would be too cold. Their winter survival was an ordeal. We'd be wrapping them burlap, protecting, sheltering them. I still like to plant them in a protected area where they're a little bit buffered, where they don't get the really hard, cold winter winds blowing through there. So if they're nestled in where they've got a little bit of a windbreak of some other plants, uh, maybe you've got the house, a fence, some kind of structure to give them a little shelter is ideal. Uh, they'll go from sun to shade, but I think they do their best kind of in that in-between spot. Now, Camellia sasanqua are the fall bloomers. They start flowering for us in October and continue flowering pretty much well into November. At some point in time by December, when the, depending when it gets really cold, that will sort of put an end to their growing season. Uh, so these are just a couple of varieties, Yuletide and Kinjaro, and we sell probably 10 others. Uh, they're, they're blooming now. But I also wanted to feature, this is a hybrid form that was developed a series of them down at the National Arboretum. Because again, we recognize that camellias are valuable addition to landscape, but their winter hardiness was a problem. Decades ago, we had a really, really bad winter that killed off almost every camellia in the National Arboretum's uh, collection. Well, the Arboretum, uh, plant breeders there, they saw this as an opportunity, like, oh, I'm going to take my really tough, hardy camellias, hybridize them. And so this became a hybridization where they're taking camellias to Sanqua, 
Camellia olifera, which is the uh, tea camellia, where we get tea that we drink from that species, hybridized them. And we, this is where we started getting a series of really durable, tough ones. Now, these fall bloomers, the flowers are a little bit smaller, but they're prolific. They're really abundant. So you'll look at the plant like this one day, then these flowers drop off, and then 20 more buds open, they drop off, then more buds open, they drop off. So they have this continuing flowering pattern that can go well into December. Of, I can get my little picture to come up here. So down here, my little inset, I went out yesterday to take a picture of this. This was um, Camellia snow flurry, the same variety you see here. But this one we've had in our display garden. I'm positive it's been at least 15 years and maybe even more. So I put that in here just to kind of give that reassurance on the cold hardiness of it. Uh, and I think also, you know, as our weather's changing and, you know, winters aren't quite as severe, I feel really, really confident recommending these to you. Uh, also, because I'm just trying to show the diversity that's out there, this is the, um, what they call an autumn crocus, uh, which is really, ooh, it's kind of at its peak bloom or just on the downhill side of that right now. So, for example, we have the bulbs in stock, but they've already kind of bloomed out. So if you plant the bulbs today, you probably be looking at flowering 12 months from now. So that's a long time to wait, but these are uh, long lived bulbs. Uh, they multiply, you know, so it might start out with just one or two blossoms. And each year that, that bulb gets, uh, it's actually a corn, but it gets um, bigger, better established, more flowers, and can give this very naturalized kind of look at the very end of summer, early part of autumn. Now there's two different plants that are, have the same name that are both called autumn crocus. Uh, the one that you see in the picture now is actually, it's not a crocus, it's a colchicum. Uh, the flowers look very much the same, but this one is bigger and it's larger and showier than the crocus. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because the autumn crocus where uh, they collect saffron from is a different species. This plant is actually, if you were to eat the um, eat the, the saffron, the anthers from it, um, this, this plant's toxic versus the other one, which is a true crocus, is used for saffron. So they both flower at the same time. They look at the same time. We sell both, but they are different plants. And uh, it's just kind of neat to see, hey, there are ways that we can engage and add flowers to a garden, even at this time of year. I'm going to show you one more uh, flower. And then we're gonna take a little break for questions before we start going into fall foliage. I uh, wanted to say a thing or two about chrysanthemums because this is chrysanthemum season and everybody knows what we sometimes call a pot mum or just, uh, you know, just mums, chrysanthemums. These are selected and bred for a diverse range of flower color. They're very prolific and dense in here, different flower forms huge selection that's out there. But these are what I'm just gonna call seasonal color. They may or may not be winter hardy. They are perennials, but they're not really bred for their cold hardiness. They're bred primarily for their flower quality. So we sell these as an annual. If you plant them in your garden and they survive and come back for you year after year, good for you. That's you won the lottery there. Um, but we don't expect them to do that. We pretty much figure, hey, you're going to get about maybe four weeks of beauty out of them and then switch out to something different. We also have per perennial chrysanthemums. If I can do this without knocking anything over. Um, these are super hardy. Uh, these are tough as nails. They spread, they multiply. I planted one small plant in my garden a few years ago. It's now covering about five foot by five foot space. This is one they call Sheffield pink. It's got a little bit of a very light shell pink to it. And then that matures and opens up almost to a white color. So these hardy mums, which we sell in our perennial section, are very reliably cold hardy. They, you don't have as broad a range of flower color and it pretty much has this sort of daisy kind of look and it's more open in its growth time. But I put it out there because again, we're talking about fall color and you can do this in berries, you can do it with flowers and you can do it with foliage. But before we get to foliage, uh, Sally, any, any people sending their questions in? 
Yes, uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, first, we have a comment about the beauty berry. This person says their beauty berry reseeds all over their yard, so they end up sharing it, um, which is interesting. Uh, okay, so next question. Um, next two questions are actually both about camellias. What kind of exposure to sun and time of day are best for the camellia? My Yuletide died in a strong morning sun. Yeah, so I don't think it would have been the sun that killed it because camellias can actually do quite well even in a full direct sun. I said to me the perfect, ideal perfect environment might be where I get a good strong morning sun and then a little bit of shelter from that really intense uh, afternoon sun. Uh, so a few hours of midday sun, morning sun, uh, and like I said, and they will even do well in full sun. They, uh, like I said, they don't want to be in a real exposed location because they're evergreens, they're broadleaf. And if we have cold, dry, windy conditions going through there, that can kill them. Yuletide is pretty reliably cold hardy. So I don't want to say it was winter kill, but it could just be a winter dieback. Or sometimes, you know, plants die. It could have been, you know, too much, not enough water or something like that. But uh, I, I would... Uh, I, just because it's sun, a sunny exposed for a sunny full sun area, that wouldn't necessarily stop me from planting a camellia there. Okay. Um, the next question, would a camellia work under a tree in a dry, dry location? Uh, under a tree, yes, but not dry. Uh, if you're going to plant in that environment, then you'll need to do some supplemental watering. The picture I showed you earlier, the, the um, snow flurry camellia with the double white flower on that is growing directly under the canopy of a mature red maple, but it's also in a stream valley that runs alongside our property, so the moisture is there. So you could plant it in that environment, but then you become responsible for seeing that you monitor the watering on it. Got it, okay, thank you. That's all the questions for now. Good, then we're gonna go back to fall foliage. Uh, so again, where we live, uh, this mid-Atlantic region, you know, we've got one of the most diverse uh, groups of plants, you know, communities of plants that you can find anywhere in the world, because uh, we've got this very topography, you know, old geology. Uh, we're right in this north-south kind of transition area. So our just the native colors and beauty we have here is fantastic. Of course, a lot of people like to go up further to the Northeast uh, where color is a little more intensified because you start getting more maples um, and the species shift that's there. But this is just to give you a little idea of sort of our natural situational clump of trees here where we've got our native dogwood in the foreground, a nice pretty hickory giving us this fabulous golden color in the background. And, and I like this because it includes the Native American holly which gives us a little bit of evergreen color. So again, we are blessed to have all these and, and everybody loves going out to look at the foliage for good reason. Uh, now I put the dogwood in there, our native uh, Cornus Florida, state tree of Virginia, of course everybody knows, because uh, here I get both the berries and the leaf color as we go into the fall. We've got many different varieties of these. Mostly they are selected for the variety of flower colors that are out there, uh, but just, uh, put that out there and say, hey, just take in and enjoy what's around you and always like to support and putting native plants into our landscape. Uh, probably right up there might be my favorite for fall foliage color is one of our native trees, black gum. Uh, this is just, it's a really nice stately durable tree uh, that as you can see, it grows in a range of habitats, you know, grows in these low oxygen or wet soil conditions that are there. Uh, it's really has very, very, very few and insignificant pest issues with it. It's got nice form to it. Uh, it's clean. It doesn't make a mess. So I'm always frequently, many times putting this out to consider if people are just looking for a nice shade tree in their home. Uh, it's also one of the very first to color up in autumn. If you go out today and you're, you know, driving you know, out just through the countryside, wherever you start to see these really bright red or bright orange trees showing up, it's good chance that you're looking at the black gum. Now, one time this tree was not really very, it wasn't available or not widely available in the nursery trade. 
uh, had a reputation being difficult to transplant, a little difficult to cope with, uh, but that's all been worked out over the years. And now we have two or three different varieties, which give you, again, sort of a little bit of variety and leaf color is the primary characteristic we look at. And again, these guys color up early in the season. They're beginning to show their color right now. So that's a, a fantastic one. And again, it, it will do well even in poor soil conditions. I uh, have to say a thing about our native red maple. Uh, again, this is a dominant tree species for us throughout the area, widely used in landscapes because their durability, their adaptability to different conditions. Uh, they grow fast for people that are looking for kind of a quick shade situation that goes on. But why I chose this picture is it's kind of neat. All three of these, the yellow, the red, and the orange tree, all three of these trees are red maples. So a lot of times when I talk about, you know, black gums, red maples, and everything, they inherently have this genetic variation. So when you plant one, it can go anything from a yellow to a red or something in between. So whenever we're talking about the tree species, red maple, then we also start discussing different cultivars. These are varieties, cultivated varieties that are cloned for a specific purpose. So we can say with maples, hey, I'm planting it because I want the red coloration. This is, as you can see in a, a shopping center here in Centerville uh, from years ago, a lot of these trees have moved on now. But we're, uh, from a design perspective, you might want to really kind of create a big, uh, splash of color, you know, big intense benefit. So you can get a variety in this case, like October glory uh, for consistency that goes on in coloration. So again, as you come into the garden center and you look at these and you see uh, red sunset, October glory, uh, North Point, you know, talk with our specialists and they can kind of help you pick out where they're selected for symmetry of form or symmetry of color. Uh, that type of a, an effect that goes on, but they're all wonderful trees. And this goes true also when I say about sugar maples. Sugar maples, they are native to Virginia. Uh, we're kind of touching into their southern limits of their range. Uh, obviously, they grow well up in the New England where they're tapped for maple syrup and everything. That's where they're most abundant. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we like to travel up there to get our scenes of fall color. But sugar maples, they tend to grow out. They're broader, they're wider. So it's a, a bigger tree uh, you know, for, for your garden to create shade that's in there. It has a, a larger leaf. So sometimes I think it's a little bit denser kind of shade in there. So to an extent, I think they do better with a little bit larger properties. But one of the things that I love about the sugar maples are these are often the ones that go through a series of color where they might start out where you start to see just a little bit of um yellow coloration and yellow starts moving more towards a red and red goes out to a, a bright orange. And sometimes you look at tree, you'll see it just kind of layered up where you see a, a range of colors developing all overlapping at the same time. So for fall coloration, this is a, a hard one to beat. And again, the varieties that you look at, say in this case, Green Mountain, a lot of these varieties, they're sort of selected for their fall coloration, but we're also selecting for their improved heat and drought tolerance to do perform a little bit better within our region. Uh, so we got to put them in there. Uh, I had to put the ginkgo in there, obviously not a native tree. Or maybe it's not obvious, but it's, um, but it, I'll tell you, it's, it's uh, this particular tree is native to China. Um, I just had the opportunity this past week, I attended a lecture. Uh, it was a, a one hour lecture on this one tree from a, a gentleman, uh, Sir Richard Crane, who actually wrote the book on ginkgos. Uh, so I, I'm just all you know excited about ginkgos now, looking at their role in the um, evolution of plants. They're very distinctive. They are the sole surviving member of this plant family. At one point, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, literally, they grew in pretty much every continent, every um, continent, you know, surrounding the Northern Hemisphere. As these continents split and drifted apart, all the others, the ones that used to grow here in North America and so on, they all died out. Uh, there was just this one remaining species that, that found a refuge in China. So today, every ginkgo tree we have in our landscape, 
all goes back to this population that survived in China. So it's got a unique story, a very unique ecology that it plays in the, in the evolution and history of plants uh, and has a very long legacy to it. Again, what we've done in the um, landscape trade is we now have varieties. I had to bring in, because we're talking about the ginkgo and honor the ginkgo, that's who's over my shoulder here. This is a variety, it's called Chi Chi. It's going to top out somewhere around six to eight feet tall because, of course, the parent tree, that can easily go over a hundred feet tall. Uh, it's really prized for many things, but this very distinctive leaf form and shape, uh, just people connect with that a lot. But as we go into the fall season, uh, they have this habit of turning this bright golden yellow they shed their leaves simultaneously. So these leaves, when the time is right, they will drop to the ground. Um, it, and we think that's triggered more by temperature than it is day length or combination. But when we get sort of the right temperature regime with the trees ready, these will just flutter down to the ground. And in Korea and China and places where they have a longer history of this tree, I think just like we have a cherry blossom festival, we go to enjoy the beautiful display of the cherry blossoms in spring. They will have events and gatherings to come and enjoy the beautiful leaf drop of the ginkgo tree in fall. So again, this is, this is a really unique tree and it deserves merit and attention in your garden. Um, and again, tough, durable, basically carefree. Uh, parodia, or this is the Persian parodia. Again, it's another introduction. Uh, this is in the summertime. As the plant gets old, you start to get this kind of peeling, exfoliating bark, which is a real plus for it. But we're talking about fall coloration. So this is out Meadow Lark Gardens, a beautiful specimen that grows out there, kind of on the edge of their lake environment. So this plant, when I say it's kind of nondescript, I, I mean, uh, throughout the summer months through the growing season, hey, it doesn't have this really distinctive form. It's got an attractive bloom, but it's so tiny, you actually have to go looking for it. Uh, the peeling bark on older ones develop, uh, but boy, at this time of year, this is when it becomes really eye-catching. Um, and I kind of have a bias towards this family of trees. So these are all in the hazel family. Uh, this is actually a witch hazel. So these plants, these are in the same plant family. And if you look at some of the qualities or characteristics, you see a similarity that exists there. It's just that witch hazel tends to be smaller, kind of a, a, a large shrub, small tree kind of dimension. What you're looking at here is actually a hybrid. Uh, we have a native witch hazel. Our native witch hazel is not my slide set, but it is flowering right now. It's in bloom today uh, with yellow flowers, have a slight fragrance to it. Um, and then it will go more towards a yellowish brown color in the fall. Uh, this is a hybrid. It's uh, actually it's the focal point in my front garden, in my front yard, uh, because I wanted the more dramatic coloration that goes on with it as we progress into the fall. They also flower for us. Uh, these are, again, the hybrids with the Asian ones. They, they will flower for us, and usually February is a peak bloom season for them. So it is a winter bloomer and the flowers are bigger and showier. Again, the one that I have planted is called Arnold's Promise, which I selected because one of the qualities is the yellow flower and a very fragrant blossom. So these will give you fragrance, bloom in the winter time, but most of all, I grow them for that fall color. Uh, this is also, and, and, and I, you guys know, I'm in a little townhouse garden, they tell me all the time, but in that townhouse, I've made room for witch hazel and I've made room for uh, the father Gillow, both members of the hazel family. Again, hats off to that whole, this whole group of plants. Uh, father Gillow, if you looked at the flowers on the witch hazel, again, this kind of bizarre, uh, we call apetalous blossom, uh, and you look at the witch hazel, you kind of start to see a similarity that goes on. This is native to the southeastern U.S., so it's not necessarily Virginia native, but it is a um, U.S. native in the southeastern region. Uh, it tends to grow as a thicket. So again, the shape or form of the plant uh, lends itself to a more naturalized environment, but this would be maybe the early part of April when you see these uh, flowers that come out. There's stamens. There's no actual petals in there. Again, it's nice fragrance. And then here it is, this is in the background when the fall coloration really starts to uh, stand out in there. So again, this group of plants gives us fall color, 
uh, it gives us interesting blooms um, and really kind of nice clean foliage through the summer. Just because I have it in the picture, I go and show uh, the Amsonia, Amsonia hubrecti. That this is an herbaceous uh, perennial, which means it's going to die to the ground in the winter time, but it has little kind of powder blue flowers on the spring, this beautiful fern-like foliage through the summer. But in about another two weeks from now, this is going to sort of take on the appearance where it just has this brilliant glowing yellow color. Uh, and again, it's from Meadow Art Gardens where they, they've uh, partnered it up with, uh, I, I know it's Chrysanthemum Pacificum, but the, the names have changed and it's got moved to it some different genus. Um, but we can help you out on that. Uh, so back to the shrubs. Um, oak leaf hydrangea. Again, this is definitely a plant for all seasons, also a southeastern U.S. native. Uh, it gets its name because the, the leaf on there looks similar to an oak leaf. So it's hydrangea corsifolia, uh, recognizing that. In the upper set, you can see this is when it is flowering, which is usually a, a late April, May time period. So it gives us a really nice flower display. Even after those blossoms fade, they will continue to hang on the plant even up to now, this time of year. But then as you go into the fall, they also bring out this fall leaf coloration. So I'm always looking for plants that have four seasons of interest, but of all those seasons, right now, the fall is really at the top of my list when I'm choosing things. Uh, sorry, I think this is my last little picture of uh, just kind of show you how some of this can work together. This is the um, witch hazel that we're talking about. This elephant ear is just a little fill in that's gone. It is now placed with Father Gilla uh, growing in there. You can see the uh, Amsonia that we talked about. And of course, some of these plants like the grasses and salvia is still looking terrific. So again, uh, and off to the corner you can't see, but this is that little uh, fall blooming uh, chrysanthemum, that Sheffield pink, which is now taken over a big spot of that garden that's in there. So think about your garden throughout the years, uh, but most of all, let us think about the fall. Woo. So I'm taking a breather now. I fit all that in and we still have a few time for questions. Uh, if we've got anybody uh, sending you messages, Sal. Thanks, yeah, we've had a couple of questions come in. If anybody else has any, feel free to send them in as you think of them. Um, the first question we have is uh, for back to flowers for a minute. If you've got blooming mums or probably a lot of other plants, if you wanna extend the bloom, is can you cover it with frost fabric or are there any things you can do to keep that flowering season going a little longer oh you can yes that's that's true um i i, I am i unfortunately i don't look that far ahead in the weather forecast but you know if you see where temperatures are dropping down into the into the low 30s you know there's a call for frost putting a, a frost blanket out there absolutely can help hold on to the blooms and extend that season you know if it's just a little potted plant you know, like this, and hey, just lift it up and bring it inside. But if we're talking your garden, yeah, we don't, we really don't like to put plastic over them. Sometimes people do that like as an absolute emergency, but the plastic doesn't breathe. Uh, so wherever we can, a uh, frost blanket, which is a, a synthetic material, it's very lightweight, but has good insulation value um, and it breathes. So that would always be our first choice. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question, how big does the dwarf fa father gilly get and can it take harsh afternoon sun? Uh, I would not put father gilly out in full all day sun. Uh, the one I showed you in the picture, oddly enough, it catches the late day afternoon sun, but it's shaded for the first half of the day. I think father gilly, gilly, I can say father gilly does his very best of where you get good morning sun and a little bit of protection from that sort of 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. kind of sun. But as long as it gets some moisture, because uh, it is a moisture loving plant, uh, you know, you can push the boundaries on that a little bit. The um, mature size on it, like I said, they, they kind of grow in a thicket and they're, they're, not, they're not fast growing. You gotta be a little patient with this plant, but it kind of starts to send little runners out. And so you start the plant and expands out almost in a little bit of a more spreading or suckering type of habit. Uh, you probably, you're going to see them run around four foot, I'm going to say average size, four foot tall, four foot wide, 
but if uh, over time, uh, they can grow bigger. Okay, thank you so much. All right, we've had some more questions come in. Uh, okay, next two questions are about your last picture. Uh, the first one is that a picture of your garden. And the second one is, it looks like in the last picture you chopped your pine tree, is that correct? That um, yes and no. Yes, yes, it is my garden, but no, that tree was not topped. That's a compact form again, because I'm in a small garden and I learned from all the mistakes everybody makes. Uh, that's a Hinoki cypress, Hinoki um, uh, came cypress obtusa, Hinoki cypress. It's a variety. It's called compact, compacta. It's been in the garden for, I'm trying to think, plant on you. It's been in the garden for about 15 years now. Um, it peaks out. It stops its growth. Now, I don't say stops. It really slows down. It's about, you know, eight to 10 foot. It's kind of a maximum height. So it's now like I said, 15 year olds old, it's about nine feet tall and that's just its natural form. I've done some pruning since that picture that was to get some repair work done. I kind of had to butcher it up because I had some repairs to the house that needed to be done. But in that picture, that's its natural form. It's never been touched. All right, thanks David. Next question are um, any of these plants that you showed good choices if you have deer in your garden or do you have any other recommendations if you're trying to get some fall color and you, you're dealing with deer? Uh, again, you know, anything in the hazel family, I'm going to fall in love with it, you know, so that's, you know, Father Gill, Witch Hazel, you know, again, the Protea guy have a little more room than I have uh, kind of thing. Also that the Amsonia, these are plants I talked about. Everybody wants that plant when they see it in the fall. We have a big grouping of plant in our display garden. People don't pay a lot of attention to it during the growing season, but in fall traffic stops for it. One of the things I love about it is that this plant, it has a very delicate texture. It, act, it looks like a fern and they can get old. They're, they're heat and drought tolerant. Uh, I actually cut mine back because it gets too big for the space. If I didn't prune it, it would easily be out at four foot by four foot. I prune it mid season to kind of manage its size and keep it within bounds. Uh, again, you know, if I was looking at larger trees you know that black gum is a hard one to beat you know it's, and, and and like i said there's others you just come and see it. so there's a plant called echianthus that i took out of my slide set because i just felt like we didn't have a room echianthus it gets a little it's in the uh azalea rhododendron family it gets a little flower it looks like a blueberry flower um in the spring but it takes on really phenomenal fall coloration i just kept that out because limited time but that's i think an underutilized shrub one that you rarely see planted in landscape uh, but i would look at because i think it's pretty it's got an interesting flower and nice fall color thanks david all right next question i'm going to go ahead and um, ask it just came in but we get this a lot so um how late into fall can people safely plant uh you can plant basically right up until the ground freezes now i would where where i get a little bit concerned is with evergreens. Uh, I'm always saying plants, uh, plants are they're like they're pumping water from their roots up out through their leaves that's out there. Uh, so most of our shrubs are a lot of our plants that shed their leaves. So they go into a really a winter dormancy. They don't have any exposed leaves. So they're basically their transpiration, their need for water greatly diminishes. And they can basically be planted, you know, anytime you can put a shovel in the ground. Evergreens, I think we have to be a little more uh, cautious with because the evergreens, they retain their foliage. So one is they, they need to have moisture um, at all times. Normally we get rain, sleet, and snow, uh, but every once in a while we hit a dry spell. And when we see winter kill, Nine times out of 10, it's not because of the cold weather, it's because of desiccation, because that plant dried out. So if you're planting late in the season, just know you still got to have a plan for watering because if it's January and it's cold, dry, windy, and your water shut off, then you need to like fill up a watering bucket and go out and take care of those plants. So that's kind of a caution I'm going to put out there. And a broadleaf evergreen, which might be like a holly, a camellia, of uh, rhododendrons they have more leaf surface um, again it's cold it's dry and it's windy they're more vulnerable so i would love to get them planted as soon as possible i.e right now 
give them an opportunity, maybe even get some roots established in the ground a little bit before they really shut down for winter. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is back to the Amson Amsonia. Can you transplant that now? Uh, yes, you can. That, that is, like I said, that is a tough, hardy, durable plant. Um, I would have no hesitation. Just realize that if you're transplanting it, you know, it's, it's just going into its fall coloration period, you know, and then it's going to shed its leaves. Okay, great. All right. So last question, because I see now it's 245. Um, what is the plant behind you with the bright pink flowers? Oh, I, that was on my slide list and I forgot to tell you about. So again, with flowers, this is an azalea. Uh, I'm glad you asked because I, I lugged it up the stairs for that reason. So this is what we call an encore azalea. So you'll hear the term repeat blooming, uh, encore or bloomathon over my shoulder. What happens is azaleas in your garden, everybody's got azaleas, or I hope you do, uh, I do, they're wonderful plants. So azaleas have set their flower buds for next year. If you go out and you look at your azalea plant, they have flower buds on. What happens with these um, encore or bloomathon types, if you look closely at it, you'll probably have about 25 or 35% of those buds open now, and then the remainder of those flowers will open for you next spring in April. So it's not really a repeat flowering. It's just that they have, rather than everything opening all at the same time in April, they have some flowers open for us now in October, going into November. And then the balance of those flowers are open for you next spring. And you might get sporadically a few in between. So we get basically two seasons of color out of this group of azaleas. And they come in a range of colors. All right. Thank you so much. All right. We are about out of time. Um, so just a um, thank you to everybody. A reminder, if you weren't able to get your question answered or if you have any questions that come up after the class, just feel free to send us an email um, and we will get back to you. So thank you so much, David. Anything you want to conclude with before we wrap up? No, I just say thanks for joining us. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do next. So if you got ideas, send them on. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Let's know if you want to hear from David about anything. I think in two weeks is going to be our last plant clinic um, before we start the holiday season. So we'll be jumping into Christmas stuff before we know it. Um, thank you so much, David. Thanks everybody for joining us today and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.